So, for those of you who know my husband, Richard, you will know that he's quite a bloke, pretty much in every way. We've been together now for more than 25 years. I know, feeling old, feeling old. In that time, I have learned a lot, I can tell you. But I've learned a lot about how to fix, drive, build, ride, renovate, and maintain boats, cars, caravans, trailers, homes, and motorbikes. I've learned a lot about the gear that's needed, the tools that's needed and involved in this work, and I've discovered a lot about the gear that we have needed to buy to use these toys, I mean vehicles, and the activities related to them. There's the skis, the wakeboards, the biscuits, the wetsuits, the life jackets, the helmets, the tents, the motorbike pants, the body armor, the gloves, and the list goes on. It is all essential, people. <laughs> now, the thing is, is that I know that some of these items are essential. Things like wetsuits for women and life jackets for everyone. But as you can imagine, I've come to doubt the need for some of these items. And I think of things like special motorbike pants. I mean, really special motorbike pants. But I have to admit, I was proved wrong. I came to see their need when Richard took one of the young guys from Papster motorbike riding a couple of years ago. The ride was in the middle of winter. It was just outside of Taupo, and this particular day was freezing. It was snowing, actually. And Richard had taken all of his gear, plus several layers of clothing. I've got to tell you, after these rides, anyway. But when he got home, he couldn't stop laughing. He told this guy about all the gear that he would need for this ride. But this young man figured that he would get by that day with just a pair of track pants. Well, let's just say that those trackies split in the first 25 minutes of the ride exactly where you don't want pants to split. And he had to suffer the consequence of near frostbite to an area you men definitely do not want frostbite. And that's all I have to say about that. I'm sure that we all have a story about a time when what we wore impacted a situation, either physically or how we were perceived or how we felt. What we wear sometimes really matters. Today we take a look at the story of the wedding feast. This story, we see that the garment provided was actually critical to the outcome. Before we read that story, I just want to give you a little bit of context. This parable is actually the third installment in a series directed at the Jewish leaders of the day. This parable is a message for the religious. And you may sit here today and you may think, oh, well, today isn't for me. I'm not religious. But you know, I don't think that human nature or our response to God has changed much over time. Maybe there's a little bit of religiosity in each one of us. If I have ever thought that maybe my actions are better than theirs, that maybe my service is just a little bit more significant. If I'm known as a Christian by my Facebook status instead of by my actions, if I hide who I am, if I wear a mask instead of being honest and humble, if I hide my failures because I think that my salvation, at least a little bit, depends on my behavior instead of Jesus, if I've taken all that Jesus has given me and won't bend to forgive or show grace or love to a colleague, a friend, or a family member, then maybe, just maybe, we've allowed a little bit of religion to creep into our thinking. And maybe today, this story is for us after all. So Jesus has just arrived in Jerusalem, and the whole town has come out en masse to worship and adore and honor him. 
And his next stop is the Jewish temple. At the Jewish temple, he sees the leaders there literally selling salvation. Jesus knocks over their tables, he scatters their money, and he has a few choice words for them. And you might be thinking, but isn't Jesus all about love and friendship? Well, you know what? Yes, he is. But what we need to remember about God, about Jesus, is that he is also a warrior. He fights for what is right. He fights for justice. Jesus calls a spade a spade. He is real, and he is honest, and he is bold. And these leaders have completely destroyed the meaning of God's gift of love, hope, and grace. And they've turned it into a religion based on behavior and good works. Jesus always rebukes those who interfere with and teach a messed up picture of grace, a distorted picture of God. So as you can imagine, these leaders are left pretty unhappy. And they return the next day to try to trap Jesus into saying something that they can use against him. And Jesus responds with this trilogy. The first two stories, the story of the two sons and the story of evil farmers, in those stories, Jesus has just explained to these Jewish leaders that the kingdom of God will be taken away from them and given to people who produce its fruits. And then he tells the third story in the trilogy, the story of the wedding feast. I'm going to have the story on the screen this morning, but if you want to follow along, it's, on, it's Matthew 22, it's on page 592 in the Brown Pew Bibles, and page 792 in the white ones. It starts off, Jesus told them other parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven. Do you know this statement is repeated more than 30 times in the book of Matthew. Matthew really wanted to get this idea across. He wanted to communicate that the kingdom of heaven is more than just a place far, far away, but a reality for us today. He wanted us to know that the kingdom of heaven is here and now, that it is Jesus. And all these paradigm shifting uber gospels paint this picture that Jesus wants to live in us and he wants to show us what our life will look like when he does. The kingdom of heaven is illustrated by the story of a king. He prepared a great wedding feast for his son, and when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they refused to come. And so he sent other servants to tell them, the feast has been prepared, the bulls and fattened cattle have been killed, and everything is ready come to the banquet. But the guests that he invited ignored them and they went their own way. One to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers, insulted them and killed them. The king was furious. He sent his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. In this Uber story, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who is preparing a feast for his son. And the first kingdom reality is that our God is relational. Our God loves to celebrate. He loves to have fun and feast together. He wants to hang out and eat with us. 
The kingdom of God is like a big banquet, a feast, a party. It's fun, people. Our God is the host. He's picking up the tab and he's being mind-blowingly generous. The wedding, the wedding is to celebrate the union. Get this, the union, the coming together of Jesus with us, with all our faults and our selfishness and baggage. Jesus wants to celebrate us with him. This table, this table that we feast at, that we celebrate at together, is Jesus with us. It represents our relationship with him. The second kingdom reality is that our God is all-inclusive. In the culture of the day, when preparing a large feast or a wedding, two invitations would be sent. The first was sent months in advance to make sure that people knew and set the date aside. We see it actually with wedding culture again today. Often when a bride and groom are getting married, they send out save the date cards so people can do just that. Then all the preparations were made, collecting food, slaughtering animals, preparing the feast, cooking the meat. It was a process and it took a significant amount of time. It was labor intensive, a labor of love, you might say. Once all the preparations had been made and everything was ready, the servants would go to those who had received an invitation and they would give them a second one which simply said, the meal is ready, please get dressed and come. So we know the king in the story is God. And we know that his son is Jesus. We know that their plan from before the beginning of time has always been to reconnect us into a relationship with them, a life at the table forever. But who are these people that are invited but choose not to come. Because our God is relational, he chooses to partner with us, with people. He chooses to reveal his love, his story, his gospel, his life through us. And back in these days, he chose the Jewish nation to bring love and light and hope to a broken world to share Jesus, to be him in a world that so desperately needed him. But sadly, they turned his message, his love, his life, into a long list of rules and regulations and requirements and behavior that had to be achieved to attain an exclusive goal rather than an inclusive community. They turned God's message from come as you are, hopeless, weary, unworthy, broken and messed up, to a club where you had to look a certain way, speak a certain way and behave a certain way to fit in. So when the invitation comes from the king, from God, to sit at the table, to come and be vulnerable, to come and be with him, they think it's unnecessary. They think that their set of rules, their adaptions, their behavior, their religion, their garment is all they need. So they make excuses. They go their own way, too busy at the farm or with their business, some so angry, they destroy the messenger. Does this sound familiar at all? Have we adapted God's message to fit into our religious culture? Have we, over the years, instead of encouraging people to invite the Holy Spirit into their lives to reveal what He wants, instead interpreted His message and come up with a set of rules for everyone, a list of behaviors that make us acceptable to join this club we call church? Have we been exclusive instead of inclusive? And have we made lame excuses? You know, I'm just not sure about Jesus. I'm really busy. 
I have a new job. I'm at uni right now. I have got so much study to do. It's just not a good season for me. I've just had a baby. Oh, look, I'm just trying to catch up on all the shows I watch on Netflix. Life is filled with lame excuses. I'm working on my car. I'm finishing my house. We have kids right now. I'm distracted. I'm single. These years are for me. My kids are grown. We get our time back. Lame excuse after lame excuse for people who at some point in their life raised their hand and said, I want to follow you. I want to be a Christian. I want to be far, part, <laughs> it was unfortunate, <laughs> part of the feast. <laughs> I want to be part of the feast. And Jesus says, so come. And we're like, well, I would, but I can't because I'm busy right now. And I think he says, it's a simple choice. Come to the table or stay at home. Celebrate or criticize. Love or ignore. Be passionate or selfish. You choose. It's up to you. I won't make you, but the offer will always remain. Come sit with me at the table. Maybe we've missed something, church. God doesn't love. He is love. He can't love us any more than he already does, and he can't love us any less. There are two groups of people in this story. There's the law keepers, and the law breakers. There's the behaviors and the misbehaviors. There's the people who felt they were close to God because they followed the rules, had the truth, worshiped on the right day. And there were those who felt they would never be right with God because they did most things wrong. Both groups thought that God's opinion about them, that the invitation, that sitting at the table was based on their behavior. But God doesn't view people how culture views them. He doesn't view them how we view each other. When will we understand that the invitation to sit at the table has never been and will never be about us? It will only and always be about him. So when these people who chose, who God asked to bring love and light to a broken world, chose not to come, chose their set of rules and behavior over his love, he invites everyone. Bring in everyone you can find. This invitation is extravagantly generous. Unlike many religions where you have to meet certain qualifications or behave in a certain way, this invitation goes out to everyone. Those who are healthy, those who are sick, those who are blind and those who can see, those who are sick, those, those who have money and those who have nothing. Those who have beautiful homes, those who have none, those who are Catholic, Muslim, Anglican, and atheist, those who put on fine clothes, and those who show up in rags, those who are rich and those who are poor, the gangsters, the drug dealers, the gossips, the prostitutes, and the addicts, they are all invited. They're welcome to sit at the table. The kingdom party, fully alive, a relationship with God forever. The feast has already begun, church, and we are all invited. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what we may have done. It doesn't matter whether we have a lot or whether we have very little. It doesn't matter how much we know or how little we know. It doesn't matter what kind of mess we've made of our life. It doesn't even matter what kind of a mess we will continue to make. We are all invited. There's a place for us at his table. But what we need to know, and this is important, church, Although we are all invited to come as we are, 
The table won't leave us that way. The table changes us. A relationship with Jesus changes us. And those who choose to come to the table walk the journey of change with us. No judgment, just love and support at the table. At royal weddings in these times, the king would provide a garment for all his guests. And this eliminated hierarchy and comparison and judgment. In this story, when the king sees a guest without the wedding garment, he is cast out. And I think back to Jesus overturning those tables in the temple. This garment represents Jesus, his life, his spirit, his goodness. And if I think that my behavior, my garment, my good works, my faith, my religion, my life is on par, is good enough to earn me salvation, then I distort his invitation of grace and love. For many are called, everyone is invited to sit at the table to live with Jesus, but few are chosen. The Greek actually says, but few pick it up. Everyone is invited, but few choose to respond. Few choose to pick up the invitation to come to the table. It's up to us, church. What are we choosing? His garment? or ours, his life, or ours. Today, two men, Max and Brandon, are choosing his life. They're choosing to, they're choosing to sit at the table to leave their old life behind, and we're gonna hear their stories now. Thanks, Max. Hello all, <clears throat> my name's Max. Um, some of you may know me as Quade's brother. I've been <laughs> coming to Papster for about four months now since I moved up from Fielding. And my relationship with God has been um, slowly built over the past year or so. Um, and even after starting my walk with God, there was never really one moment that sort of decided it all for me. Um, it was more of a slow walk up a big hill, continuously wondering, you know, am I better off just walking back down to the bottom to what I know? but I'm um, pushing through to the top and going, oh, that's what Christianity looks like. That's what God looks like. Um, but obviously after walking a little bit longer, I realized that I'm not at the top of the mountain at all. And I probably never will reach the top of the mountain, but um, you know, the higher I climb, the more I, the more I see and understand, which is awesome. But um, me and my brother both came to know God. We weren't raised Christian. Um, we had a stepmom who was trying to be, and in hindsight, I think she was new to her face. Um, but she had a, you know, she was trying to get her daughters to be Christian as well. Uh, it was my dad, my brother, me, and I guess my baby brother too. But I kind of see it like a, like a blind man trying to lead other blind men and children carrying a baby. So probably wouldn't have been the easiest thing to do for her. Um, and when obviously she fell short and messed up like we all do, um, that's what me and Quaid saw and focused on, and that's what we attributed to Christianity. Um, and we thought that's what a follower of God was, you know, someone that, someone that fell short and missed the mark all the time. But um, yeah, in hindsight, I see she was just new to her faith and that's, that's fine, we all mess up. But um, me and Quaid also came to know God through seeing our first healthy example of a relationship or healthy relationship. Um, Quaid's was Nick and Taz and mine was my ex-girlfriend Grace, her parents, John and Tracy. They were um, always just really loving to me the first time I went around there. They were really nice, just offering me this and that, um, being inquisitive, but genuinely inquisitive, not like a who are you and what do you want with my daughter kind of approach. They were just really nice and loving. And I mean, a lot of people are when you first go into their house, but um, with them, it was, you know, they're, they're people's true colors come out after a while, but with these guys, it was like seventh, eighth time going around there, and they were so, so benevolent to me, so nice, um, same calm talk between themselves and their kids, and I was like, like, what's going on here? Like, what's happening here? This is real strange for me, it's messing with me a bit. And um, yeah, so Grace invited me to church, and because her, her dad passed her to church, um, because her granddad was going to do a sermon as well. There was a whole family of pastors, so I was kind of trapped. Um, but I ended up going along, and to be honest, the first time I didn't, didn't really gel with the pastor or the, um, the, the sermon that was given, but I felt something inside of me like a little while later saying, just, just go back when her dad's preaching. And so I found myself in there um, about a week or so later, and I actually really enjoyed it that time. You know, I, I really connected with the sermon that was preached and the ideas that were preached, and I was like, yeah, it felt like a, a good place to be. 
and I actually stayed behind as well and met all the other church members, which only took about two minutes because it was quite a small church. But nevertheless, it was like a, a real cool church and will always be a very integral part of my journey. Um, so yeah, I kept going back to church and that was my first attempt at really getting to know God and, and giving him a chance. But um, when I first moved up to Auckland, I got a job with Amnesty International as a street fundraiser. I was the annoying person on the street that stops you on the way to work and goes, hey bro, have you got a minute? And then starts asking you to sign up to stuff. Um, and I struggled a lot in that job when I first started because um, I was purely focused on the sign-ups, on getting people to donate, and I didn't put any effort or energy into getting to know them first, um, into getting to know them, um, build a relationship with them personally. And I had that same approach with God. Um, initially, I was always, always asking for this and that, show me where to get this, I want this, how can I get it? Just demanding things of him and never bothering to put effort and time into building a relationship with him through reading his word and getting to know him through prayer and stuff. Um, but to be honest, I'm just a real impatient person and if I was sort of mid prayer and it turned into a conversation, I'm probably pretty freaked out. Um, so I'm kind of glad that didn't happen, but I've just been slowly learning to, um, as it says in Proverbs 3 verse 5, um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding, but seek his will in all you do and he'll make a path straight. So that's what I've been trying to do, and um, the hardest part about that for me was trusting in the Lord with all my heart. You know, I found myself going, he can have half, he can have three quarters, but I was just reluctant to give him the whole thing. And it wasn't until I, um, I heard Andre say the 360 Lit Camp, a few of us attended, he said, um, you know, God doesn't want part of you, he wants all of you. He wants all of you, the good, the bad, the ugly, the broken, you know. He wants all of you um, as you are, you know, without the mask, just who you are. And um, the thing that was hard for me to give up was the bad side to me. You know, Quaid once told me the metaphor of the two dogs that live inside you. Um, there's one that's good, the Holy Spirit, and one that's evil, it's sin. And he says, the one you feed the most will win. And um, I guess I've been knowingly, and as much as I dislike admitting it, knowingly feeding that sin for the last 20 years or so, and I've grown quite an attachment to that, that evil dog, and that evil dog's grown quite an attachment to me. And um, I guess I didn't realize how, how hard it, had its grips on me until um, about eight weeks ago, I went to the Contagious Christian course we had here. And it was the first weekend um, that I hadn't drunk or smoked drugs since I was 15. And um, it was a real eye-opener to me for two things. The, the first was, yeah, how attached I was to sin and how I didn't realize how hard it was to let go until I tried letting go and I was like, wow. And the second thing that made me realize was that just because God has a perfect plan for us all, it doesn't mean we follow that path perfectly. You know, we, we all stray and we all deviate from, at some point. But for me, I feel like I, I didn't just deviate, I like blatantly stopped and turned around, you know, and um, it was because I was so attached to sin, like when I, was, when I was hurt, when I was angry, when I was sad, that was where I went for comfort, you know, that, that evil dog was comfort to me, and that's why I could indulge in all those things, because I didn't know any, know any better, it was, it was what I knew, it was all I knew, if you will. But um, one thing that made me, it sparked something different was about a month ago, I thought, you know, if, if this is the walk to God, if this is the path to God, and I'm denying that and turning away, going this way. Who am I, who am I walking to? And is that who I really want driving my life? And I guess seeing as I'm standing up here now, you know who I want driving my life, this fellow up here. Um, and that's why I've made the decision to not only get baptized, but I've also started studying a Bachelor of Ministry with Laidlaw College, so I can help God transform lives, yeah. yeah. Thanks so I can, um, yeah, help God transform lives the way he's transformed my own. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to thank um, Quaid for walking with me this journey this last year, you know, just being with me, encouraging me. Um, Carl, I'm not sure where he is, for all the life groups and stuff he's had with us, just being able to throw any question at him, not too big or too small. Um, Norm, for the impact he's had and helping me decide to, to study. Um, Kira, for helping me craft my story. Will, for always pushing me and motivating me to step up and become a leader at um, 360. Um, John, Tracy, and Grace, you know, though they aren't here, um, I guess they're the ones that kickstarted me on this journey and yeah, will always be close to my heart. And um, just everyone here at Babster, all of you guys that have just, just shared with me the love and the grace um, that comes with being a follower, you know. There was no judgment for me coming here, which I was afraid of. Everyone's just loved on me and, and been graceful and made me feel like this is home. You know, I kind of feel like that's why I am today. I feel like God's called me home. Um, so this is me, I'm just coming as I am, you know, flawed, failed, but, but loved. And yeah, I just wanna say so thank you. So this is me, this is my story. <laughs> Cheers, guys. As I was growing up, I was bullied a lot. Um, 
the gang life was all I knew. I grew up in that town. I used to get angry and go away. Am I always getting picked on all the time? And so I wandered off and I didn't want to know him anymore. And yeah, life wasn't too great. It was so full of darkness. I was heading down and I was walking down the wrong path. I felt like path of destruction. I always used to put my wife and my children down. Um, I used to beat them up like they were men. Um, the one thing I loved most was drugs. I was always taking it. Um, every day, if, if I didn't have it, I would get so angry. I would take it from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed. I would sell a lot of it, uh, even to school kids, to whoever, just to get the next uh, load, I guess, um, to feed my habit. Until um, one day, um, our boy, my son, Brock, was rushed to um, hospital. He had a severe asthma attack, and um, he couldn't breathe. Um, it wasn't looking too good. The doctors came in, and told us uh, that he, he might not make it through the night. And that's when it um, really hit me and really sunk in then. I d didn't know what to do. So I was, uh, decided to pray. I haven't talked to God for a long time. I think it was 20 years I haven't talked to him. Um, you know, I realized that's how far I wandered off. Um, I wasn't sure if he would answer my prayers, but I told God if, um, if, if you let Brock make it free the night, please let him live. I will promise I will change my life for you and, and I will follow and serve you. And the amazing thing that happened, Brock pulled through and was, yeah, I was in awe, I was like, wow. So when that happened, I, I was like, okay, um, I feel like uh, I want to change now, I want to change my ways, change my life, give up the drugs, the tobacco, the alcohol, give up everything. But I realized I couldn't do it on my own. I, I had to pray and ask God for more of his help and his guidance to get me through. It's been a, it's been an amazing blessing, and I think it was the best choice I ever made. I'm just so thankful for what the Lord has done to my life. Um, it made me a new person. The old is gone, and the new is here. Oh, back then, I never used to smile. I was frowning. I was always negative, and and always put down people and gossip and judge, judging people. The change is, is it's so amazing. It's, uh, uh, it's hard to explain. It's like, wow, well, I'm smiling a lot now. I'm so positive as um, I'm doing active stuff. And the kids are looking at me really funny, like, something different about that and um i'm helping out a lot around the house and i've lost 14 kgs in the last four months it's been so tough but it's worth it i can be around longer for the kids when i came to papita i came by myself and i wanted to ask the lord of I have a big family and I was wondering, can you please bring all of them here? And I'm choosing to be baptized today because I want to commit my life to the Lord and follow Him, serve Him, seek Him, talk to Him on a daily basis, tell people about Him that He can turn you into something amazing and awesome 
take your life to another level. I thank my um, family for putting up, uh, putting up with me and for forgiving me for all the negative and all the hard years that we went through. I thank my wife for supporting me and helping me, for being patient with me, um, for always being there. You could have left me how many times, but you chose not to. You still stuck with me, um, and I thank the Lord for you and the children. I want to say sorry to my adult children for the way I treated them and we were so hard on them. Now they complain why am I so nice to the little ones because they didn't realize how hard they had it. And I just wish I could give it back to the adult kids. My name's B. And I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and this is my story. So church, this is B, otherwise known as Brandon, but B's, B's cool. Um, I'm gonna invite, man, if I know your family are here, B just sitting there in the front, couple of rows you have children here some nieces some nephews your mother is here and um, and others and I'm just going to invite you guys and if there's anyone from solid community who would like to come and stand um, in support of B please um, invite you to come forward I don't know B very well, except he's been coming to my Sabbath school classes, my Saturday morning classes. And whenever this guy walks into that Saturday morning class, he just lights up the room with a smile. And I've pretty much just heard his story just like you have. And I can only think of one word, and that's transformation. And you know um, when love is in the room, when you can't say the words, and you just, you just lost for words because of love. And, and, and I know that's what um, Brendan has discovered in his life. He has become awake to love, awake to the love of God. And whatever preconception he had before this moment of waking up to God's love <laughs> has been kind of quashed and, and has come alive in this, in this whole deal of of um, living inside of the love of God's kingdom as Karen has been talking about. And so B, we stand here this morning because you believe that God is good. <laughs> because you believe that God doesn't live in the past. That maybe for our sake, we visit it every now and then, but he doesn't live there. <laughs> And you're here this morning because, B, you believe that your future is full of God. But what God loves the most is this time right here in the present, this moment where you stand here and in front of people you make a declaration that you believe that when the Bible says that we can become new creatures, that the old is gone and that the new has come, you believe that to be true. And that is why you're here this morning. And so be. Grab my arm there, mate. Because you believe in God, because you believe He is good, because you believe that He is in your future, He's been in your past, bro. He's never left you. He's always been there. You stand here this morning because you've become awake to it and your family stand here witnessing it. And because of your belief in Jesus Christ, 
be, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And can I just say, man, I mean, this body of believers that we call Pepster is amazing. You know, B came to solid with Andrew because he wanted to better himself. And then Andrew introduced him to us. And now he wants to join a life group and he's standing in the font today. This is how people become awake to the kingdom of God. And so, man, God bless you. You're a living testimony of God's kingdom. Amen. Come here, my man. <laughs> And you heard this guy speak. I didn't. I missed his. Um, I missed his um, his talk. But I've been um, meeting with this guy, and you may remember his brother was baptized a, a wee while ago. And uh, I'm just just going to ask um, if there is anybody that is from Max's life Monday night life group, from his um, Sabbath morning youth group, um, any of the young adults that are here um, that would like to come up and support Max, please please do that. never ceases to amaze me and I, and I hope it never ceases to amaze you as believers as, as a body of Christ that man it's amazing how God works you know I mean I first met um, Quaid through Nick and Taryn and Nick and Taryn weren't actually worshipping here at the time. I think they were worshipping it with another faith community, but they came to be a part of ours. We got introduced to his brother Quaid and uh, through Norman, and Norman was studying with Quaid, and Norm baptised Quaid. And then this guy comes up from, uh, where are you from? Fielding. Fielding, man, who would live there? But this guy, man, he, he comes up from Fielding of all places, and he comes to live in Auckland. And, um, and then it's like we start up this Monday night life group out there, out, out west. And we just have these incredible conversations. And Max, you've had lots and lots of questions. And you've, yeah, and at times you've been a tortured soul because of your past, you know? And because, man, can God do this? Can He really change me? Can I, I really want this, but I don't know, I don't know. And to see you standing here today is a testament of God's faithfulness and His goodness and your willingness to be open to what God can do in your life. And so, Max... Um, amazing stories, even just now. <laughs> um, but the number of people that have been involved in Max's life, and you see them here, um, uh, so many touch points, so many touch points of pointing you to the kingdom of God. And so you stand here today, Max, um, with an open heart to God's kingdom and what He's going to do in your life. It's exciting. And so, Max, because of your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> and you know, um, we can't let these moments go by without putting the invitation out there. And it always starts with an invitation, doesn't it? <laughs> this journey towards God's kingdom, this journey to being the best version of yourself, this journey to purpose always starts with an invitation. And there's a beautiful song I think the guys are gonna, going to sing. Is that right? You're going to sing this song, Come As You Are, because that's really what the invitation is. It's what Karen has been sharing with us this morning this invite by God just to come as you are. And any misconception or anything that somebody told you about God that you don't like or doesn't feel like you can come to Him, whatever they told you was wrong. Because <laughs> if you knew, if you knew how much God loves you, if you knew how important and how central you were to His kingdom, you would come, you would come. And so we're going to invite you while our, our, um, our singers are singing this 
beautiful song of invitation. We're just going to invite you to come and join the crowd up the front and, and just come if you feel, yeah, it's time. I want to awaken to God's kingdom. I want to wake up to God's love. Please come. Now, I'm not going to push this. I mean, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in going on and on until somebody comes up the front. But if you are here and you feel God's spirit moving, would you come? Would you come and just come as you are? And we'll meet with you and we'll talk to you and we'll help you and we'll let you know that you're not alone. If you're here this morning, would you come? It doesn't get any better than that. Hey, church. You know, I've gone to church. I've gone to church. I've been part of the club. I've come to the room my whole life, 46 years. It was the culture of my family. We knew the rules. And for the most part, we lived those rules out. And when we didn't, we made sure that our mask was firmly in place so no one knew that we had broken them. And we remained part of the club, the club we called church. But over the years, I came to see more and more people who not only came to the room, but they began to sit at the table. And I saw the change that that made in their life, and I wanted it. I wasn't so sure how to get it, but I knew that I wanted it. Just over 12 years ago, I finally understood what it all meant. And I chose to sit at the table and it turned my life upside down. Because although we come to the table just as we are, broken and burdened and searching, the table changes us. Just like it's changed B, just like it changed Max, it changed me. This thing we call church went from a place, a room that I met friends and made plans with to a table where people got to see the real me, warts and all, and loved me anyway. I got inclusive community. It went from a room where I volunteered as long as it was convenient to me to a place where I serve passionately so that people meet Jesus. It went from a room where my pain and my burdens were heavy to a table where I could unload them. And at the table, I got to leave my hurt and my shame and my guilt. And he replaced them with peace and healing and unconditional love. When we sit at the table, church, and allow it to change us, the room looks different. It looks like what we just saw. It becomes everything we value. It becomes inclusive and relevant and generous and real and raw and messy, but beautiful. The wedding feast is an open invitation. It's all inclusive. Everyone is welcome at the table, and we need to know that nothing in our life is more important than choosing God's invitation. We may think that our job is the most important thing in our life right now, and it might be important, but it's not the most important thing. Our family is important, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing in our life is a relationship with God. And the choice to come to the table is a choice that we need to make every day. 
Are we too busy with other things to take the time to get to know Him? Because at the end of the day, it won't matter how many hours we put in at work or how many things we bought for our kids. It won't matter what kind of car we drive or how nice our house is. All that will matter is the time we took to sit at the table. And as Stephen said a few weeks back, at the table, there are no good people and there are no bad people. There are just greatly loved people. To finish today, because the invitation to come to the table is for every one of us, because it's a choice that we all need to make every day, we don't wanna finish without giving everybody the opportunity to do just that, to choose Jesus, whether it's for the first time or whether it's for the umpteenth time, because you know that you need him again today. And you've seen people come to the table today and they've write, written on it. We've left labels, labels other people have given us, labels we gave ourselves. But today we've laid those down at the tables because Jesus wants to take those and he wants to give us his life in return. And so we're gonna continue to worship and if you feel God calling you to choose him again today, if you wanna come and lay down a label, a burden, a hurt, a sorrow, then come forward and write that down on our table. God wants to take it from you and he wants to replace it with his garment, with his life. To represent that, we've got a card for you, a place card. It's a reminder that you can come as you are, that you are invited, that you are loved. And we declare the promise of Isaiah 46.4 over your life today on that card. It says, I am He. I am He who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. So come to the table, church. Come as you are. Leave your burdens and replace them with him. And if you like, you can return to your seat, but you're also welcome to just stay down here in this space and worship and we'll pray together as we end. Let's pray. God, we just want to thank you so much that we can come to you as we are, that we can come broken and messed up, that we can come with all our baggage, with all our faults, with all our selfishness, and we can just lay them down at your feet. Thank you that you promised to take them from us. And thank you that no matter how many times we walk away, we can always come back to the table, that you are always there, you are always waiting. You're always ready to take us back. Um, and so God, we just, we're so grateful today. And we just, we love you and we praise you and we honor you so much for what you do in and through our lives. And God, we just pray that you would change this place that we would all come to sit at the table so that people would see you, so that we would produce fruit, so that we would be a people that, that it's just so clear that people see you so clearly in and through us, God. We want that. Um, we want that in this place every time. And so, God, we just, we love you. Um, and we're so grateful today. Amen. <laughs>